Hello and welcome to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I am your host and movie critic Dan Burke. This is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. You are listening to me on Boston Free Radio and watching me on Scat V. Glad to have you with me. But first, before I get to those reviews, I'm going to get to the top of the box office, what people have been watching this past weekend. Number one at the box office for the third weekend in a row, although probably it's not going to go to a fourth weekend based on the fact that Batman vs. Superman is coming out next weekend. But the number one film for the third week in a row is Zootopia, the Walt Disney animated film that is getting some pretty good reviews and also raking in some cash, as I'm about to tell you. This weekend it grossed $37.2 million. Its total domestic box office gross is $200.9 million, and that is from a budget of $150 million. Internationally, it's doing even better, having grossed $593.5 million around the world. So here in the United States, it is a tentative hit, but around the world, it is most definitely certified. Allegiant is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number two at the box office. Allegiant being the third movie in the Divergence series, and based on a book of the same name. Allegiant grossed... $29 million, which is pretty good for its opening weekend, and it certainly has Zootopia to compete against. But that is against a budget of $110 million, so Allegiant has a pretty long way to go. Around the world, though, it's grossed $83 million, which is good, but still not a hit yet. Miracles from Heaven also debuted this weekend. It's the second highest grossing debut movie and the number three movie at the box office this weekend. Miracles from Heaven grossed a very impressive $14.8 million this weekend, a total domestic box office gross of $18.4 million, and that is against a relatively modest budget of $13 million. So, Miracles from Heaven has not been out for very long, but its relatively modest budget makes it a, certif excuse me, a tentative hit so far, and chances are it will be a certified hit by next week. However, I don't expect to see it number one or number two at the box office, next week or anytime soon. 10 Cloverfield Lane is number three at the box office this weekend, having grossed $12.5 million this weekend in its second week in release. A total domestic box office gross of $45.2 million, and that is against a budget of $15 million. Again, a relatively modestly budgeted movie, and if you actually see the movie, you wouldn't be surprised how low budget it actually is. But already, in just two weeks, it is a certified hit. Around the world, it's grossed a little bit more. It's grossed $52.5 million compared to $45.2 million in the United States. But regardless, here in the States and around the world, it is a certified hit. Deadpool, in its sixth week in release, is number five at the box office. This weekend, it grossed $8 million even. It's grossed a total domestic box office gross of $341 million, and that is against a budget of $58 million. And around the world, in case you're curious, it has grossed $731 million. So I could do the math and tell you how much it's grossed. It's definitely grossed more than six times as much as it costs to make here in the States alone, but the point is, around the world and here in the States, it is a certified hit. London Has Fallen is number six at the box office this weekend. This weekend it grossed $6.8 million in its third week in release. It has grossed a total domestic box office gross of $50 million even, but that is against a budget of $60 million. So it's not a hit here in the States yet. Around the world it's done a little bit better, having grossed $95 million, but still not particularly impressive numbers. London Has Fallen is not a hit yet here in the States, but it's a tentative hit around the world. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, also in its third week in release, is not doing as well as London Has Fallen, and that's not very good for this movie. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot grossed $2.8 million this weekend, at number 7 at the box office, if I didn't say that earlier. A total domestic box office gross of $19.3 million, and that, unfortunately, is against a budget of $35 million. So this may be Tina Fey's first box office flop, or at least it's looking that way. And I don't have the international numbers for you right now, but 
If it's not looking good in the States, it's probably not breaking any records around the world. The perfect match is at number eight at the box office this weekend, surprisingly actually doing better than the Brothers Grimsby, as I'm about to tell you. The perfect match grossed $2 million this weekend, a total domestic box office gross of $7.4 million. And while that might, may not seem like much, it's only on a budget of $5 million. So in just two weeks, the perfect match became a tentative hit, and it might be a certified hit in about two weeks or so. International numbers I don't have for you right now. Grimsby, also known as the Brothers Grimsby here in the States, is number nine at the box office this weekend, and it is suffering mightily. This weekend it grossed $1.4 million. Its total domestic box office gross is $5.9 million, and that is against a budget of $35 million. And while this was a British-made movie, and its success in the States isn't entirely, well, it doesn't depend entirely on the States for it to be a success, around the world it's not doing especially well, having grossed $22.6 million. So it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. However, The Revenant at number 10 of the box office in its 13th week in release is still hanging in there. It'll probably do really well in DVD sales, I would imagine. This weekend, it grossed $1.2 million. Its total domestic box office gross is $181.1 million, and that is against a budget of $135 million. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Hello, My Name is Doris. This is the latest starring Sally Field, and it's directed by Michael Showalter, who you might remember from Wet Hot American Summer, as well as the very short-lived but cult favorite Comedy Central show, Stella. And he's actually one of those directors I've been, or actors and directors, I've been following since his directorial debut, The Baxter, from 2005. Now, The Baxter is one of those underrated romantic comedies, and it had the unfortunate fate of coming out around the same time as The 40-Year-Old Virgin. And The 40-Year-Old Virgin was better than The Baxter, but it was somewhat of a different comedy, and unfortunately, critics were very quick to compare the two. However, Hello, My Name is Doris is one of those films that, fortunately for Michael Showalter and Sally Field, no less, stands out on its own. I don't think I've ever seen a quirky romantic comedy like that, first and foremost because there aren't very many quirky romantic comedies starring women who are pushing 70 who aren't Diane Keaton. <laughs> I guess that's just the... That, that's just how Hollywood works. So, Hello, My Name is Doris is about a woman named Doris. She's a woman who is pushing 70, whose mother, with whom she was living, and was probably 90 or so, but the movie never says, just died. So, she's a little lost and grieving, but a self-help seminar, which she attends with her best friend, played by Tyne Daly, who is also very funny in this movie, inspires her to romantically pursue her younger co-worker. So, Sally Field's character, Doris Miller, works at a business that, it's not exactly clear what the business does, but it's a business that is updated to modern times. That is, a lot of younger people work there, so it's very much like a Silicon Valley workplace, if you will, except it's in Brooklyn. And her younger co-worker is named John Fremont, that's his character's name, and he's played by Max Greenfield. And Max Greenfield, for those of you who don't know, is an actor who is only 35 years old, and he's best known for being in movies like The Big Short, and he was also in Veronica Mars and The New Girl on TV. So when you see the two of them together, is there really any chemistry between them? No. <laughs> Nor should there be any chemistry given their age alone. But I think it's one of those things where the character of Doris falls for this younger person and you, the viewer, are looking at this lack of relationship. I shouldn't say lack of relationship. This infatuation that Doris has with John Fremont, which borders on obsessive, but not, isn't creepily obsessive, but you're still looking at it as the viewer and you're thinking to yourself, 
this is never going to work based solely on the age difference between the two. And even if it was an older man pining after a younger woman, it still doesn't feel right. But you can absolutely sympathize with Doris as Sally Field plays her because I think everyone has been in that situation where they've fallen for somebody who may or may not be the right person for them for whatever reason, be it age difference, personality difference. And so there are those poignant feelings of love that I know I've certainly had in my life um, several times, probably more times than I'd be willing to admit. And I could absolutely relate to what I was seeing on the screen while at the same time cringing during some scenes and thinking, oh no, Doris, don't do it. <laughs> but the whole point of this movie is that love makes you do some crazy things from time to time. And there are always ebbs and peaks of felicity and heartbreak that happen. And I, I liked the dynamic that was going on between Sally Field and Max Greenfield in this movie, and I was really taken in by the story. I also liked the subplot of Sally Field grieving over her mother's death, and also she still lives in the same house she lived in growing up, and yet she's developed habits that are also borderline, but not extreme, hoarding. In other words, she has a house that's not very well kept, there are stacks of books and other things she doesn't need that are piling up in various corners of the house. And she also owns a cat, which might make you quick to call her a crazy cat lady, but she actually works for a living, so it's not in the cat lady category. But the dynamic that plays out between her brother, Todd, played by Stephen Root, and her sister-in-law, Cynthia, who's married to Todd, who's played by Wendy McClendon Covey, is very real. And I certainly have experienced this with other members of my family as well. But the realism in the movie is just one of the takeaways to Hello, My Name is Doris. What really works is the misguided love story in this film. And the extremes to which Doris goes to de declare her love for this guy. It's, it's all really sweet, and it, it does border creepy, as I say, but it's altogether very poignant, very relatable, and quirky enough that there were a lot of parts that actually made me laugh out loud. And I didn't expect to laugh out loud at this kind of movie. I expected to maybe smirk at a couple of parts, but... There are certain parts, like, for instance, where Doris daydreams, and then when she's literally woken up from these daydreams in a very awkward state of falling into these daydreams, it's just absolutely funny. And I can't imagine another actress besides Sally Field playing this part of Doris, but I'm sure other older actresses could. But Hello, My Name is Doris gets my rating of a knockout because it is an absolutely original romantic comedy. I think Michael Showalter has really found his footing as a director, and I'd like to see him in other things, and I'd like to see Sally Field have a few other movies as well. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Beasts of No Nation. Beasts of No Nation has fallen into some controversy, not because of its content, but because of the fact that much to a lot of people's dismay, Beasts of No Nation was not nominated for any Academy Awards. However, it was nominated for one Golden Globe Award for Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role, Idris Elba. And I think, obviously there's been a lot of controversy with the hashtag Oscar So White, which I think was a very valid controversy. But I think the reason that Beasts of No Nation was not nominated for a bunch of Academy Awards or as was not nominated for any Academy Awards was more because of the fact that it was released by Netflix and not into as many theaters and not so much because it had a predominantly black cast. And I, I do have to admit that I saw a lot of movies last year. I go to the movies quite a bit, and I see 
three to five movies a week. And I live in Boston, which is not New York or LA, but a lot of movies that aren't first one run movies that maybe get played in select cities before going nationwide get played here. And I don't ever remember Beasts of No Nation being released to theaters. And I really wish that it had been released to theaters rather than Netflix. I guess me being so used to going to the movie theaters, sitting down and having the screen command my undivided attention may have, I guess you could say, spoiled me from watching movies at home. I guess I'm in that mentality where if I want to watch something on Netflix, it's usually a TV show and not necessarily a movie unless I have time where I can just sit there and watch it from beginning to end without even taking any breaks. But anyway, Beasts of No Nation, regardless of whether you see it in theaters or probably at home, on TV, on your computer, or what have you, is a film that is definitely well worth seeing. It's just a matter of what kind of mood you have to be in to see the movie, or maybe it's a matter of timing, because it is not a particularly pleasant movie. So it's a drama based on the experiences of Agu, who's a child soldier fighting the civil war of an unnamed African country. So this movie could take place probably anywhere in Africa. It's directed and the screenplay was written by Kerry Joji Fukunaga. And this is actually an American director, a Japanese American, who was born in Oakland, California. But there are actually no Americans in this movie that I know of. And the star of the movie is the child actor who played Agu, whose name is Abraham Atta. And he, fortunately, he got a lot of attention at the Oscars when he was one of the presenters for one award, along with another fellow child actor, uh, Jacob Tremblay. And like Jacob Tremblay, Mr. Atta is in a movie that is not for kids. And it's unpleasant is just an understatement for this kind of movie. He plays a child soldier and not just any child soldier, but a child soldier who's forced into becoming a child soldier because his family is killed right before his eyes and he has nowhere else to go. And whether it's his grace or whether it's salvation or a curse for him to be brought into this legion of army soldiers. It's probably more of a curse because he's experiencing war at first hand and he's actually ordered by his commandant, played very well here by Idris Elba, to actually kill a man as he's down on his knees begging for his life. And he has to take a machete and according to the commandant, ordered to strike this guy over the head with it until he's dead. And it's a really intense scene, one of several intense scenes that I don't, I can't exactly tell you what kind of mood you have to be in to watch this movie, maybe not a happy mood. It, it's hard to say. It's, it's just that Beast of No Nation is a movie that in the tradition of other movies that have kids in them but are not for kids, like the movie Kids, it's a harrowing movie to watch. And I think it's an important movie, though, because, I, in fact, a lot of unpleasant movies are important movies. The ones that aren't important movies are exploitation. But Beasts of No Nation is not exploitative at all. It's based on a novel written by Uzo Dinma Awiala, and chances are, if you haven't heard of this author, which is probable, you probably haven't read the book on which Beast of No Nation is based. But after, I think a, a great movie based on a book not only serves as a great movie standing on its own, but if I haven't read the book, a great movie based on a book makes me want to read the book. And I will definitely check out Awi Ala's book when I get the chance. And you should too. But Beasts of No Nation, in and of itself, 
its release on Netflix, even though it is a Netflix original film, and I commend Netflix for releasing original films, I think it didn't get any nominated for any Oscars. By the way, it's a knockout, I, in case that wasn't clear enough. But I don't, I don't think it got the attention it deserved because people think of Netflix as TV. And when Netflix releases original movies, even though they're great, and certainly HBO or even theater quality, I think people are under the impression that it's a made-for-TV movie, which over the last 30 to 40 years, a made-for-TV movie is a movie that was subpar with movies that were released in theaters. Don't let that fool you. See Beasts of No Nation and see it streaming and see it from beginning to end nonstop. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is 45 Years. This is another movie that got a lot of attention during the Oscars, even though it was only nominated for one Oscar. And of course, I have my list of movies I've seen but haven't reviewed on Words on Film, and I'm about to cross 45 years off the list, but I'm getting this one off the list because I gotta get all the movies that were eligible for and or nominated for last year's Oscars out of the way, so 45 years is the last one on the list. So as some of you may know, 45 years was nominated for one Oscar for Best Actress, Charlotte Rampling, who was the oldest actress to be nominated for this award. And Charlotte Rampling has been in movies for several years. On IMDb, she has 119 credits to her name. Probably 115 of those are, are movies and not TV shows. The movies for which she's best known that are listed here on IMDb include uh, Melancholia, directed by Lars von Trier, The Duchess, starring Kira Knightley, and Swimming Pool from 2003. She was in one movie, actually my favorite Woody Allen movie, Stardust Memories. She was also in The Verdict with Jodie Foster. And she was also in a 1976 movie called The Far Side of Paradise, which I haven't seen, but I've heard great things about it. So 45 Years is a movie that kind of went under the radar, but went above the radar slightly when it was nominated for that one Oscar. So 45 Years is a slow-paced movie, very slow-paced, about a married couple who have been married for 45 years, hence the title of this movie, who live in England, who are preparing to celebrate their wedding anniversary when they receive shattering news that promises to forever change the course of their lives. Jeff Mercer, before he married Kate, was actually not only dating, but engaged to a woman who went on a hiking trip one day and never came back. And the shattering news that presents itself to Jeff and therefore Kate is that her body was actually found frozen on one of these hiking trails. So the movie fortunately doesn't show the body being frozen because it could either be really horrifying or really hilarious. But the point is not how this woman died, but the effect she had on Kate's husband, both before she and Jeff got married, and also after he finds out exactly how she died. And even though Jeff stayed faithful to Kate th throughout their marriage, and at least as not, not as far as the movie is concerned, ever had any extramarital affairs, the, the news of this woman's death affects both of them. So it's almost as if there was infidelity that, was, that caused this marriage to be tested, so to speak. Or at least spoken infidelity and not fidelity which is acted upon, or rather infidelity that's acted upon. There's another good note in this movie that even though these two have been married for 45 years, they have never had any children. And you learn in the movie that the reason is because Kate actually could never have children. And there's actually one, there, there are a number of poignant and memorable scenes in this film. Among them was the very last scene, which ends the movie on a somewhat ambiguous note, but is still really powerful based solely on Charlotte Rampling's performance. 
But there's also a scene where Charlotte Rampling goes up to her attic where home movies are being stored, and she finds a home movie of this woman to whom Jeff was previously engaged and with whom she, he had a relationship. That is kind of redundant, but you're kind of going with me here. But you don't get a clear view of what Charlotte Rampling is seeing when she fires up the projector and shows this, or rather screens this home movie for herself. You, but you see enough. And one of the things that really sells this scene is Charlotte Rampling's reactions to what she's seeing. So it's not a film I normally give a knockout, you should absolutely go see it, but it's a profoundly moving film, and for that reason it gets my rating of a knockout. And I think that's really all there is to say about the movie. That's all with Words on Film for this week. I'm Dan Burke, your host and movie critic. Thank you so much for listening and for watching me this week. And until next week, I'll see you at the movies.